So we're today here at the Panzer Museum in Munster, Germany, and I have a special guest, Martin Kahn, who is um, ex Australian Defence Force Cavalry officer. Yeah. And you also, I mean, you you are now you you basically work in the defence industry to a certain degree. Yeah, so I'm, I'm the director of Applied Virtual Simulation. Uh, we're a small company based in Australia, and we uh, we build simulators uh, for the Australian Army, the New Zealand Army, um, things like vehicle weapon systems, things of that nature. So, and 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 you you mentioned before we talked a bit uh, what we talked about. You mentioned where, where it could be going. So, so what is your view on on what will happen in the future or development, for instance, with tanks? Because there's always there's always the discussion. Um, you don't need tanks anymore because they're anti-tank guns, they're powerful anti-tank uh, anti rock um, missiles mm -hmm. and everything. What, what's your view on this from, from your personal background and everything? Well, in the future, the thing I think we'll see is a decoupling of the tank's primary systems. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, yeah, essentially, with the tank, you've got... Uh, you've got its weapon system, you've got its sensors, you, and you've got its command and controller, its crew, and they're all together in this one box. Yeah. So I, I think in the future what we'll see is those subsystems being decoupled and broken apart and, and uh, the autonomous and semi-autonomous uh, you know, technologies that are being developed are, are really going to drive that. Um, one of the... You know, perhaps the most overriding um, design priority uh, for armoured vehicles into the future is, is crew protection. So this means that vehicles are getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And when you look at uh, even new cavalry vehicles, they're absolutely monstrous compared to vehicles of you know, the 80s and 90s. So the vehicle's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Is this also yeah. due to... Due to the use of uh, impro improvised explosive devices that, that they were used more, because I know that the, the APCs were not particularly well done, and then they introduced the MRAPs, which were basically from South America because they had more experience. Is this related to that, or is it in general? Well, well it's, yeah, it's in general, it's, and certainly modern vehicle design. And, and we're perhaps talking here more about cavalry vehicles um, and infantry transports. Uh, yeah, the threat was from improvised explosive devices and um, landmines, things of that nature, um, which really drove the design in a, in a particular direction. You know, you can't optimize for every threat. So it, it's a trade-off, yeah, yeah. you know, but overall protection, be it from uh, IEDs, explosive form projectiles, mines, um, the crew survivability is really the uh, key driver in armored vehicle design. Now, this, this results in a heavier vehicle. Um, but if you're armoring the vehicle, you've got to armor you know, the weapon systems and the sensors and everything like that. So what I expect ah, to see okay, yeah. is that the vehicle will become decoupled. So your lethality system, your weapon system, may even potentially be on its own independent vehicle that can maneuver independent of the command and control or, or the crew. So you may have a sensor subsystem, a weapon subsystem, and your, your crew or your command and control oh. subsystem, and they're actually three different vehicles. And what that enables you to do is maneuver in such a way that you, you sort of optimize each part. So, uh, you know, for example, one of the, one of the uh, companies that we work with uh, produces a small unmanned ground vehicle, you know, sort of this size, little six wheel thing. Uh, and they can put a 30 millimeter cannon on it. You know, they can put Hellfire missiles on it. You know, this thing is not much bigger than a lawnmower. You know, and it, and it can Long have, yeah. yeah, the chain gun from an Apache or, or Hellfire missiles on it. So, you know, you can maneuver that into a position where it will be most effective, maneuver your crew compartment or your crew vehicle into a, a more protected position, and then maybe maneuver your sensor system. And the, the sensor system might be... Yeah, it could be everything. You could, you could also couple it with, with other technology as well. Could be a drone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about, like, for me, it was like for tanks, since, since the situational awareness is rather bad in them, mm -hmm. that you attach drone armies or something to them. Yeah. But I've never thought about, like, detaching the weapon system. But, but that actually allows for a complete hull down position to a certain degree. Absolutely. That yeah. you, you basically stick out a periscope at best, I mean, or several drones. And with mm. drones, you could also make them with, with, 
with redundancy that you have five, five drones, but you only need three drones for a complete 3D view. I mean, you, basically yeah. you can get then the the situational awareness of a computer game almost. Yeah, I mean that's that's essentially the dream. Uh, you know, if if you were to put uh, a tank crew, you know, a three-man tank crew, uh, you know, up against somebody fighting from a third-person perspective, <laughs> you know, particularly in close combat. You back the, the third person perspective every every time. I mean, nowadays there a lot of drones are used, especially also by by non um, how how do you call it? non non country armies by yeah non conventional by forces yeah, non, yeah sure. non conventional forces. But but how you would see this if if two conventional forces fight each other? Could it be that they they have a chance to cancel out the drone way more easily because a drone is is rather small and nimble. Mm -hmm. But also, there's a lot of frequency jamming you could perform. You could probably shoot them down rather easily. What, what do you see that, that would drones in a conventional war of two fighters uh, would would be particularly threatened, or would they even, or would they have also a good chance to survive? Uh, well, I think it depends upon the sophistication of the the, the drone itself. Um, the drones that we're seeing used in uh, contemporary warfare by non-state actors are uh, off-the-shelf yeah, drones, uh, right? Consumer-oriented products, yeah. yeah. Uh, they require GPS information to navigate. Uh, they transmit on, um, you yeah, know, they transmit on um, you know, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum or five, uh, 5 gigahertz. So they're easy to detect and their electronic signature is sort of unmistakable um, so, so for what it is. If you had faced a, a commercial drone nowadays, you you would have probably easily dispatched it. As if, you can de if you can detect it. Okay, uh, so the detection is the main problem. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And can you then jam it easily or? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you can buy uh, off-the-shelf uh, drone jammers. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, for, they're for sale now. Um, okay, so basically in the military, so we assume that the military has drone jammers that just they punch through or they have electronic warfare system that target the drone and bring it down easily, I assume? Uh, yeah, well, it's certainly capable of jamming the drones, but you know that they're jamming your low-end drones, right? Your consumer drones that you can go and buy, you know, what we're using to film here today. But you know, when, you, when you look up the technology spectrum, you may get drones that, you know, yeah. don't, don't require GPS to navigate, that, you know, have their own internal machine vision that can fly completely autonomously and return completely autonomously. And, and that's one of the things that's, that's quite lacking, that's kind of holding back unmanned ground vehicles is the fact that you know, unless you want a big long cable dragging ah. out behind your vehicle, uh, you know, that, that drone is gonna be emitting something um, and that em those emissions can be detected. So uh, it, it, it comes, you know, in a conventional warfare context, it, it may come down to uh, uh, you know something analogous to air combat or, or submarine yeah. combat, where who turns on their who turns on their system first? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know. So so basically, for for a regular infantryman or regular guy, the the ultimate drone on the ground is hard to see, but but with military system, it's basically Christmas tree running around. Yeah. Yes. Anything that uh, you know, anything that admits on a, an electromagnetic spectrum is easy to detect, but. The, the concept of camouflage um, is, is sort of an apt analogy here because if you're fighting in an urban environment, there's all kinds of electronic devices ah, yeah. pumping out, uh, you know, um, electromagnetic radiation on these you know, public bands. So, you know, the concept of rolling into a town and turning on your jammer and just killing all communications, you know, that might not be something that's acceptable. So you know, drones can camouflage themselves in, in, you know, technologically sophisticated environments like, like modern cities. But, you know, in, in, the, in the bush, if you're, or in the field, if you're, you know, 200 kilometers from the nearest city and all of a sudden you start seeing 2.4 gigahertz signal and, and, and you know, the, the, the signature of something like that is very um, precise and distinctive. Uh, or it's probably one of your soldiers in the back playing with his phone or yeah, trying yeah. to get Wi-Fi reception, but it could be a drone and that's essentially like a, like a flashlight in the dark.
No, I think that's about it. Thanks for the invitation to come to the uh, Panzer Museum. Uh, it's really awesome here in Munster. I guess you want to plug it, but yeah, definitely worth a visit. Yeah, thank you for joining and, and filming. And yeah, big thank you here to the Panzer Museum Munster and also to Hafner behind the camera. So thank you for watching and see you next time.